Hello everyone, we are Nidhi Kasseran and Isabel Chi from Bachelors of International Business. And today we have a very special guest with here with us, our external advisor, Mr. Jan Wong. So please, Mr. Wong, introduce yourself. Sure, thank you so much, Isabel. My name is Jen. I'm the founder and online strategist of Open Minds. Uh, ever since then, I have actually bootstrapped eight different companies from different industries. And I actually started my entire entrepreneurship journey at the age of 17. Uh, apart from running companies, I speak in a lot of conferences globally. I've also been on TEDx twice. I mentor quite a number of startups, not just in Malaysia, but within the region through Techstars and also the Singapore Next 50 uh, initiative. Recently, I've also some quite exciting news. I finally launched my first book campaign entitled uh, Building Your Digital Net Worth. It's written specifically for students and entrepreneurs uh, to learn how they can use digital to their advantage. I see. Thank you so much, Mr. Wong. So um, when you were 18, you started your first business, Genesis IT Solutions and Shirts for Real. Mm -hmm. Could you share with us how was it possible that you spent 0% on advertisements? Well, it's very much possible if you think about it. I think that the biggest misconception uh, of entrepreneurship or starting a business is that many people think that you need to put a lot of money to start, a lot of capital. And number two, many people think that you need a lot of money to advertisements to run a company. But contrary to popular belief, you can actually start a company really with not investing anything or not even having a high capital. And that was exactly what I went through. Being 17, 18 years old, um, money was always, a, it's definitely a problem, right? We only survive, or rather I survived from the allowance my parents gave me. And I didn't come from a very wealthy family. It was, I remember very clearly, it was just a 300 ringgit allowance monthly. And that's supposed to be food for petrol, for my entertainment, whatever it is, all within that, right? So starting a company does not require that much of money. So to tackle this particular problem, I had to be a little bit smart in, in doing some of these things, right? So the official term to this entire process is called bootstrapping. But back then, of course, I didn't know what bootstrapping really is. I was just really trying to maximize every dollar spent or every time I have. So there are two things that I did. Number one, to start the company to reduce the amount of capital put into it. I was very aware that I couldn't buy stock upfront to be sold. So in return, I needed to provide services in return of time. And therefore, I actually started off with a service-based business, which is through Genesis IT Solutions, to basically help my friends or my peers and my classmates speed up their computers, formatting computers, and to really earn some money from there before I eventually scaled the company. But when it comes to marketing, I had to be very smart with it as well. I knew that, number one, I could actually get clients based on my classmates and friends, but they would only support me to... An, uh, so there's a limit, right, of how much I can support. But as I go along, I realized that to get more people to know about me, I needed my friends to talk about me. I needed to even uh, find different ways to get myself being recognized out there. And the easiest way to do it was to use digital marketing, to use different social media platforms. So I was in forums, the Laoyat Forum in Malaysia. I was very active on Twitter. I wrote my own blog. I created my own website. I was posting on, on Facebook. And all these things actually helped me get myself out there and that in turn converted customers to contact me directly via PMs or DMs. In fact, this particular method does not just work with my first two companies, Just For Real and Genesis. Even until today with Open Minds, a company that I'm working on right now, we still employ the same mechanics, the same procedures in making sure that every money or dollar spent or every activity they have done will be able to generate the leads or customers that we are looking for. I see. So thank you for your insightful comment on it. Next off, can you tell us a little bit more about Open Mind Resources? What made you start the company and what were the challenges involved in doing so? Sure. So I will just tell you what Open Minds is really all about first. So Open Minds is actually an eight-year-old marketing technology company based in Malaysia, Singapore, and Hong Kong. In short, we help different businesses, whether it's SMEs or corporates, figure out digital transformation through a few things, through data analytics, through using of different technology and different type of process optimization methodology. So it sounds complicated. It also maybe sounds cool to some of you. But when we first started, we were really just on a mission to do two very simple things. Number one is to help businesses understand technology. And number two, to build a company that people can come and do the things they love an environment that can thrive in and a, ben and a place that can benefit from. And in the past eight years, we have kept very true to our word, although we face many challenges. But it comes when it comes to 
the why I've started it, that is a different story altogether. Because when I started my other companies, what I realized was that to get a company from point zero to point one, and then from point one to point two, there's a lot of need in, of course, marketing. And when I learned that market, I, I didn't come from a business background, all right? Uh, no business background. I came from a pure IT technology background. So I was a programmer, I was a coder. So you can imagine as a geek, you know, sitting behind the screens, all I knew was to code. I can't speak like what I'm doing right now. You put me in the presentation, I shiver in front of crowds. I can't do a lot of things that I'm doing right now. So back then, when I was running my companies, I realized that just relying on my coding skills can only get me to a certain level. I'm not saying it's bad, just that it isn't, isn't sufficient for me to grow or scale the company. So when I started picking up marketing, I realized that, hey, this marketing thing is not really interesting, but I, what I found is that this technology world that I'm so well versed in could very well complement the business world. And it was a point of time, and until today, you still witness it actually, in a lot of companies, they tend to separate this group of people, right? The tech guys will probably sit in a different room, just give them coding. The marketing, business, advertising, sales guys sit in a different room, they do their own thing. And they hardly come together to kind of communicate. But when I was in the tech world learning marketing, I realized that there were many points that there is some kind of a synergy. And if you are able to understand these two worlds, that's where digital marketing in general will be able to give you the results that you want. And that's got me very interested. And I started experimenting. So I looked up search engine optimization. I look at how social media uh, applications work. I find out how do you develop Facebook apps. And I try to integrate a lot of all these technological aspects into marketing. And guess what? Throughout all my businesses, uh, we managed to do pretty well, whether it's in the e-commerce businesses I uh, was in, whether it was in a Facebook app development company, a consultancy company, a fashion-based company I've started as well. It all actually did pretty all right. And that got me then interested to say, hey, maybe this is a skill that I could provide for companies out there that are looking out for such services as well. And that's where Open Minds came to be a company that's able to connect both marketing and technology and have been servicing hundreds of clients in the past eight years. So from a company perspective, uh, for, or rather from Open Minds perspective, that's pretty much how it first started. Then um, how about your employees? How, was, how were you able to share this idea with your employees so that they were able to take this idea of yours and being able to craft it in a way to share it with others? Hmm. To be honest, in the earlier days, it was tough. I mean, no. now we have a lot more people that understood it, but in the earlier days, nobody actually want, understood what is marketing technology. Like I mentioned, these two worlds are pretty much apart, right? So even in the early days, it was a huge education process uh, for the employees that come through. Although in fact, until today, we are still very amazed with the first employee that decided to join us. You know, in the earlier days, it was just a couple of guys in the very small room, you know, it's just a 150 square feet room. So it's actually kind of like a bedroom size with a few tables and there's a bunch of guys working together. We're very surprised that our first employee would actually want to join us until today. It's still a mystery of why, uh, but we are very grateful. And through that, we have always been trying to reinforce and we believe very much in education. So even as team members join us, we put in a lot of initiative in educating them what's happening around, right? So we always encourage them to, hey, don't just look at your job scope. Don't just look at Malaysia. Look at what's happening around the world. Look at other companies, reference from them. And we try to embed this culture of education and self-learning and self-growth in many aspects of our company. That's why even if you look at our company culture, uh, even from day one as you join, we make sure you understand the vision. We make sure that you at least hear what we want to accomplish as a company. And then on a weekly basis, we always encourage team-based learning where teams will gather together and every team member actually takes turn to share what they've learned from the industry every week. If we're doing this without fail for the past eight years, unless it's a public holiday. So it's not easy. In fact, it's not just the employment part. It was difficult. It was also challenging trying to convince clients that there is a need to talk about both marketing and technology together. So it was a slow start, but it all turned out very well. Especially today, in today's era right now, we are going through the global pandemic. So this is very important. Digital marketing mm -hmm. has, has gone to another level at currently. So how do you think your knowledge, uh, congratulations for your book, by the way. And I think this is going to help Thank you. a lot of businesses and students like who are very interested in, in this field. 
So like, how do you think your book can actually convince like brick and mortar companies to shift their, to indulge in digital marketing? That's a very, very good question. To be honest, there's no way to force a business or force an individual to believe in digital because ultimately this is, uh, digital marketing is something that requires consistency. It requires a certain amount of effort. It requires a certain amount of understanding. So I wouldn't blame anyone that would still think that digital marketing is not the way forward, but I want to encourage everybody that's listening to actually think about this, right? If you don't believe in technology and don't believe in digital, just think about you as a consumer. We are pretty much glued to technology, even if you wanted to escape technology, right? It's literally impossible, especially if you're living in cities, right? You just think about it. Your phone itself is a piece of technology. The whole idea of you logging into Facebook and posting something, watching a live webinar or uh, something like that on YouTube that we're having right now, or you're buying something, you're ordering a Grab ride, you're buying something from Grab food, or you're just paying using e-wallets, or you're driving to a shopping mall and you're seeing these digital billboards that changes uh, every few seconds and you drive in a parking lot, you pay your parking ticket, we literally can't escape technology. And then comes the question, if as consumers, we are so glued towards technology, and if your business is not adopting technology, how far do you think your, your business can grow or can scale? Now, when you put this in a perspective, I hope it becomes a little bit clearer right now. That's the role of technology. Then comes the next question of adoption, right? So you have technology as something that's important that we've just established, the next step is to adopt it. How can I even get started? And that is exactly why I've written this book, right? So this book is not going to be, a, it's, it's not an, an ordinary book just to tell you how good technology is all that. If you actually flip through the pages, this book actually brings you a day-by-day -day guide and every day teaches you one thing, just one thing you need to know about digital marketing and technology. At the end of the entire book, you will be able to know how you can actually implement this daily and not just take it as a one-time task. And remember, I talked about consistency. That's how companies should actually start looking towards technology. Whether you are a company, an individual, or a student listening to this, adopting technology into your life is, is really pretty much starting at incremental steps. If I'm just going to give you the latest piece of technology, whether it's virtual reality, augmented reality, big data, and whatever, right? If we're just going to throw it to you right now, chances are you'll be confused. You'll be like, what's this? It's not relevant to me. But when I start introducing it to you in smaller chunks, just remember the first time when you installed Instagram and it's so foreign, you don't understand it. After a few tries, you kind of get a hang out of it. And then for some of us, we're addicted to it, right? We turn on uh, Instagram stories and we start posting stuff. Same goes with TikTok. When TikTok was first launched, everybody was like, what's this weird platform? You know, you, you turn it on, you don't need to follow anybody, but there's this contents of random people dancing in front of a screen. It's a, such a peculiar platform, right? But after a while, we kind of get a hang out of it and hey, this thing is quite enjoyable. So similarly for business, if you're to implement or adopt technology, always start at incremental levels. Ask yourself, what is the simplest form? Maybe it's just posting every day on Facebook. That could be your step one. Step two, start going on live webinars. Step three, you try to incorporate some products to it. Step four, try to automate your, your customer service. Right? So if you break it down to smaller points, suddenly technology becomes a lot more accessible, a lot more cost effective, and a lot more easier for you to pick up and scale over time, even though we are in this pandemic. Thank you so much. This is, a, this is actually very insightful and it's going to be quite helpful to some students and businesses as well. So like we shift, we move to another question. Mm -hmm. um, for during the past few days, uh, I've actually um, been through your Instagram and everything, and you mentioned about um, how you would have been in different countries right now if the pandemic would not have <laughs> happened. So like being in different countries, I wanted to ask you about language barrier. What do you think mm -hmm. about languages? Do you think it's really important to learn the language of the country you're visiting, especially since in business, you're doing business internationally? So how do you mm -hmm, think it's mm -hmm. important? First, when it comes to language, right, I must say that we are very fortunate to be in this part of the world. Uh, and being Malaysian, we are exposed to at least three to four different languages growing up, right? I mean, your Chinese, your Malay, your, your Indian and English. So at, at the very least, you're exposed to three to four languages. And I tell you, this really helps. Language 
do help. You talk about uh, me posting that post. It's very true because in 2019, I was actually hardly in Malaysia. Uh, every every month, I'm somewhere and I've only been here for a couple of weeks in, in Malaysia. So to be honest, in 2020, this is the first time I've been in Malaysia for so long because of MCO and all that. <laughs> and we're stuck in here for a very, very long time. So it's a huge change of lifestyle uh, for me. And being Malaysian, I only know my handful of languages, right? I know my English, I know my Malay, and because at home sometimes with my friends, we speak Mandarin and Cantonese. So these four things, which is great in Asia, especially when China is opening up and we do have some dealings uh, in China and we have an office in Hong Kong as well. So the proficiency of these languages has helped us very much. In fact, one thing I realized is that even though it's just Chinese and English, and being in some of these Asian speaking countries, uh, people are very fascinated of how many languages we can handle and understand as a Malaysian and how proficient we are that to the extent that we can just switch in and out. You know, we talk about how rojak our language is, right? That we can blend English, Malay, Chinese, everything in one particular sentence. But it's something very fascinating for a lot of foreigners, even in business. But unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, in some other countries, like in European countries, and we don't speak some of the European languages, and that has been a minor disadvantage. Now, we have some clients also based in Germany, uh, France, and some of the European countries, and it, it does get a little bit tough when they start talking amidst themselves, because in a meeting, it's not just us, right? There are other colleagues. And when they start talking comfortably, trying to convey certain messages, uh, it becomes a little bit tricky. And sometimes I do wish that, hey, maybe I should take up some German class, you know, I learned some French so that I can pick up some of the keywords. And it doesn't help, especially when in business and they're talking and suddenly you hear your name come up, you know, something, something, Jen. And then you're like, sorry, did you, did you mention me? Oh, no, no, we are just discussing. And then they continue on, you know, so you don't really know what's going on in a conversation, but you're very sure that do mention you. But if you're able to pick up the language and to be honest, I don't think that you need to be extremely proficient. Let's say in, in German, for example. I mean, it'd be great if you can, but even if you can just pick up words or understand basic sentences, it's definitely going to be very, very helpful beyond communication, but it's actually something to even impress. If a certain conversation happens and you're able to reply them fluently in just a sentence or two, or just to pick up keywords and continue on the conversation in like English maybe, that would actually help build that rapport with that client, with the supplier, or with that uh, business partner. And this is from a true story because uh, we, have been, we have been with a German client for quite a number of years right now. And right now, me and my business partner can pick up some very basic German statements or, or expressions or terminology. And that helped us understand and pick up very simple cues in a discussion. When somebody says something, okay, we know we are heading towards a break soon. Or, oh, we understand that this is an issue. You know, that's why they use certain words. Or we can actually gauge the expression through the usage of the words as well. So language is definitely very helpful, especially if you're planning to do business internationally. Oh, thank you so much. Um, another thing I would like to ask you is when you said that language, you have different businesses in different parts, right? In Hong Kong and in Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken. Is it in Vietnam? Uh, no, we have some engagements in Vietnam, but no, we are in Singapore, Malaysia and Hong Kong. Uh, okay, so when you talk about doing business internationally, just like you said, you have some engagement in Vietnam. Does mm -hmm. it, is it that you, you get clients from other parts of the world, for instance, in America, for in Europe, you just mentioned Germany. How is it that you're able to share? Because in America, we already have some very good established businesses on digital marketing. Mm -hmm. How do you keep up with the competition? Very good question. Now, one thing that we need to understand with this digital enabled world, right? It's the whole thing of the world is really getting smaller and smaller. Uh, gone were the days where we'll need to be physically there to compete uh, because of the invention of all these different social media connectivity tools and LinkedIn and all of that. The world has really, really shrunk. This means that you can be operating any part of the world, but still be able to deliver that form of uh, service or product to your clients. And that's exactly what we're doing, right? So when we put ourselves up on the internet and people start recognizing us for the work that we do, people that are interested will come and also speak to us. I think this comes down to multiple disciplines. Of course, there's a digital marketing aspect, but what is also very important is the digital branding and the digital positioning aspect of the business. How you're able to put yourself up to say that, hey, we are not just a hyper-local company, 
yes, we are based in Malaysia. Yes, we are based in Singapore. Yes, we are based in Hong Kong. But hey, we are equipped, ready, and experienced to handle clients and projects from a global level. Right, so positioning is that you're able to position yourself that way. Number two, you need to be able to showcase that kind of experience and expertise as well. So that's where some of these webinars come in. That's where the Zoom call comes in. That's where some of your case studies or testimonials comes in to be able to uh, close the deal as well. But when you talk about competition, right? So one of the main things that we have at Open Minds is what I call an unfair advantage. It's the uh, it's few things. Number one. It's the language understanding, right? The uh, language proficiency. That's actually the first thing. Why? Because in Southeast Asia, if you look at it, there are not many countries that are good in English. If you look at our neighboring countries, right? We have Malaysia. Look at Singapore. Sure, their their English proficiency is pretty good. But you look at Indonesia. You look at Thailand. You look at uh, some certain parts of Philippines. You look at the the countries be, be uh, beside us. Then you will find that English is actually not as common. And for someone to be Fluent, that is even more rare. So language proficiency is one. Number two, it's cost. Being in Southeast Asia, we are rising right now in terms of economy and whatnot. Um, cost of production of products and services is still relatively cheaper in many parts compared to many parts of the world. If a country, a, a client from a country, let's say in Europe or in the US, were to look towards East and want to find a company, these are the typical con the considerations, right? They look at China and then say, yeah, China is very cheap, but I can't speak Chinese, right? It's very difficult. I Maybe there's some trust issues. I don't really understand them. I don't want to go there. Then if they look at really the lower labor cost countries, they go to Vietnam, they go to Myanmar, they go to Cambodia, maybe the understanding is very poor. It's very difficult to communicate. Maybe it's very difficult to have a business dealing because uh, the country is a bit uncertain. There's a lot of economic factors that come into the way. Uh, maybe there's some political situation. I do not know. Then it, it comes down to just a selective few in Southeast Asia, right? It's between usually Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia. But if you compare among these four, you have Singapore that is, yeah, okay, notably ahead, but cost for Singapore is also relatively higher. So in this case, if you're talking about balance of um, the, the knowledge workers, the experience and language and cost, Malaysia kind of fits the bill. And that's one area, the second part of the unfair advantage. Of course, lastly, that comes down to, again, uh, the, the people and the talent that we have within the company. I think we take pride and open minds that a lot of our talents are top-notch. We They go through very vigorous interview processes to be where they are today. And, be, and with open minds, we have been very actively uh, educating people. We don't mind sharing knowledge. We don't mind teaching others. And that has enabled us to go a lot further than some of our competitors out there. Okay, thank you. Um, along the same lines, just like you just mentioned, sharing knowledge and going globally, actually, um, there mm -hmm. are pros and cons to that. Cons, by cons, I mean you get a lot of criticism. Mm -hmm. And from that, I mean you get constructive criticism at times. In mm -hmm. one of your past talks, you actually mentioned, you, t you said how constructive criticism is sugarcoating negative aspect of someone. So like, how mm -hmm. would you... How would you think? How would you take it in a way? Like, how would you take constructive criticism? Actually, since you mentioned mm. it's like sugarcoating negative aspects. Yeah, because you see, the thing is that constructive criticism is is great, right? But there are it takes two hands to clap for this constructive criticism to to actually uh, achieve what you want to achieve. Many people just use this term loosely to just say something nice. That's why I talk about it being. Uh, sugarcoating a particular phrase instead of just telling it straight up, right? So when I say two hands to clap, these are the two things. Number one, it needs to be given as a true constructive criticism, which you, it's actually not easy, you know, to be very neutral uh, in your emotions, very neutral in your reactions and response, and to state it out in a very factual and information manner to somebody without being influenced by all these things. That's one. And number two, for constructive criticism to merge and hit well, it needs to also be received very well on the other end and not to take it as an insult, not to take it as a complaint, not to take it as some sort of a negative backlash towards what he or she has done. So in a situation like that, and if you are not comfortable or you don't really know what's the best way to do it or you don't know how this would be response, it's actually a lot better to give a feedback as is. So how we do it in our company is we will literally just tell you, look, I have something to tell you. 
and this is the context, and here it is, and I'll tell you as is. I feel that in this generation especially, it's more important for all of us to be able to accept criticism and feedback directly without having to beat around the bush or trying to put out nice points and try to make you feel good at the same time because that actually is counterproductive because we don't know you as a recipient or me as a recipient. What am I thinking? You could be actually giving a constructive criticism in your definition, but to me, I could take it wrong or I would just take it as, yeah, I guess that means I'm doing quite all right. You know, I don't need to change. I think I'm okay because it's all sugar-coated so nicely and delivered to me. But if you really want to get things done in the times moving forward in this really fast-paced world, it's actually better to sit the person down, go through to it, both sides being open, and then to share whatever that needs to be shared, really just uh, firing off just like that. Okay, thank you. Since, uh, since now you're the external advisor for our course, which is um, BSC International Business, mm -hmm. um, at Sunway Education Group, the development of students' character, self-confidence self and integrity is actually considered, it's like a, a main objective for the for mm. Sunway University. So like, do you think that constructive criticism for you as an external advisor, do you think when you will constructively criticize a student, will it actually help achieve this goal? Mm. This, to be honest, this question is a, a little bit tricky, right? Because again, I've come back to having constructive criticism is definitely good, right? But again, the two hands need to clap, meaning whether it's from an institutional perspective or whether it's a lecturer or professor trying to convey the student, both ends have to be able to receive it well. Both hands need to understand the context without taking it too hard and also to not take it too hard. So, but what, one thing I realize is that people today or students today are a lot more sensitive than before. Like every single thing that will get triggered or um, people are just on a higher note right now, right? So, but I believe that for the students, you mentioned three things, I'm not mistaken, right? The character, integrity, and self-confidence. For these three things to be instilled in students, uh, it's not just the role of the lecturers that needs to, to, to give that kind of a feedback or give that kind of a constructive criticism they're talking about. That's one. Number two, the students not only need to accept it, but number three, the environment within the institution needs to also be able to promote it, meaning the interactions between students, between peers, the interactions in the clubs and the activities that the student partakes, the, the speakers or whoever that's being engaged should be part of this ecosystem within the, the group, needs to all be able to sing the same song, to be able to clap the same hands, if not, there will always be a lopsided, right? Because the, 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 the negative part towards constructive criticism is that if it only constantly comes from one party and one party only, then it becomes like a finger pointing, right? It becomes like a parent saying that, no, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, it's not good for you, you need to do that, you need to do this. And then that becomes something of, a, becomes negative, although that wasn't the initial intention. So it's more than that. It's the lecturers, it's the students themselves and then the environment, three things coming together to be able to achieve the development of these three areas. All right, thank you so much. That was, that was all of our questions that we planned for today's session. So is there anything you would like to add, Isabel? Uh, there's nothing for me to add. Thank you. Is there any last words you would like to say to Sunway students, Mr. Wong? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, maybe some of you have heard this before because I always talk about this uh, and I'll end with the same note again, right? I always believe that as a student, you need to have a mindset of an entrepreneur or rather you need to have a mindset that goes beyond you being a student. Because I always believe that as a student, sometimes we tend to limit ourselves to say that, hey, we are young, we are small, we don't have the experience, we don't have the right skill, we don't have the right work. And we use all these as excuses to prevent us from moving further. But you need to realize that as you go into university, as you do this course, right, these years are extremely precious years for you to be able to explore your passion and grow your experience by leaps and bounds. And if you're going to limit yourself by this mindset that thinking that you're small and insignificant, then I tell you that by the point of even when you graduate, you will still feel the same way. Right, so use this opportunity to break out of that mindset because 
your mindset will determine the size of the life that you're going to live in the many, many more years to come. Thank you so much, Mr. Wang. And thank you so much for giving us your time, your precious time for attending this and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you. Thank you. The pleasure is mine. Thank you so much.